connectivity and conservation. So today I'm going to be talking about wolverine habitat quality, connectivity, and prioritization at the landscape scale. Um, I'll be talking about one portion of my dissertation work that primarily focuses on wolverines. So I just want a show of hands, how many people here have actually seen a wolverine? Oh wow, it's actually a decent portion. So fun fact, I have actually never seen a wolverine, <laughs> um, which is kind of sad, but hopefully someday have seen a honey badger, which is a close relative, and that's, that's what I'm going to keep claiming as my closest relative. But um, if you're less familiar with wolverines, don't be alarmed. Uh, Hugh Jackman, who played Wolverine in the X-Men movies for 17 years, didn't know wolverines were real animals and spent all of his time watching YouTube videos of wolves to prepare for his role. So they're a pretty lesser known carnivore, but a carnivore that's actually found here in Montana, uh, wolverines are in the Mustelid or Mustelidae family, and so their closest relatives are things like skunks and otters, badgers, weasels, ferrets, and other species like that. Wolverines are incredibly snow adapted, so they have these large snowshoe-like paws and a thick oily coat their coat is actually so insulated that they can lay on snow and not melt it with their body heat. So we see wolverines being active year round, unlike some other carnivores we see in the lower 48. Wolverines typically are found in high elevation public land. So we see wolverines in places like the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem and in and around Glacier, the Cas North Cascades. So they're highly adapted, as I mentioned, for these cold weather climates and we see them typically in these high elevation areas. <coughs> and there's about 250 to 350 estimated wolverines in the lower 48, uh, which might seem quite small. There's an estimated 10,000-ish breeding adults in Canada and Alaska, and there's also wolverines in Mongolia, Russia, and portions of Europe. There have been some controversies that I'm sure a lot of you having been in this area are familiar with about listing wolverines under the Endangered Species Act as threatened, so there's been several listing attempts and none of them have been successful. So part of my approach to this research was to come up with conservation uh, for wolverines that can be done regardless of whether or not they're listed. So appropriate conservation actions regardless of kind of what level of protection wolverines currently have. And to address these questions, or to, to address these conservation actions, I focused on three main questions. So the first research question that I asked was how do different commonly used statistical methods inform our understanding of species resource selection functions or across scale and between sexes. And I know it's like a lot of information all in one question, but basically what I did is I took these logistic resource selection function models, which is the most common type of, of way we see people predicting habitat for a species. So they use these models, but the types of data that are commonly in these models don't always meet all the requirements. So there are assumptions that are violated. And so I took that method and I took that output and I compared it to machine learning algorithm output, which has different assumptions. So I took these two methods and I said, are we getting similar results if we have different assumptions and maybe we're violating them part of the time and not the other? And generally, what I found in this section is that we get very similar results regardless of what method we're using. And there are some sex-specific differences, but not as many as we see in other studies. And then I also did this at different scales. So I did this within the home range of a wolverine, so the area that they're hanging out every day, and then at a much broader scale and compared differences. And there were some differences. And I'm giving you the quick overview of this chapter because we're actually going to focus more on my last chapter of my dissertation because I've presented these a lot more. My second data chapter asks the question of how landscape resistance and connectivity differ between resident and dispersing individuals. So wolverines, they patrol the home range, and when the young are old enough, they typically leave their mothers and they cross from mountain ranges between these mountain ranges and valley bottoms. And during that time period, they're moving in much different habitat than where they would typically live. But a lot of the times when people model wolverine connectivity, they're using this like linear trend between habitat quality and resistance. So they're saying animals are gonna move exactly how they move in their home ranges when they're dispersing, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. So in this chapter, I looked at different resistance values and then validated it with animals that were dispersing. And I found that these dispersing animals are much, much less sensitive to changes in habitat quality. So they'll kind of move through anything um, compared to residents. And a great example of this is we actually had a collared animal from our study, M56, and he lived in 
uh, Wyoming, and he moved down into Colorado and then was shot in North Dakota. So he made this massive journey across sagebrush habitat and all this low quality wolverine habitat, like agricultural land. And it just shows that he's, he was so much less sensitive to habitat than say an animal patrolling its mountaintop home range. The question that I'm gonna spend a lot of time on today is what information is important to include in a systematic conservation plan to best support wolverine connectivity under future climate change conditions? And this is my longest question. And this is the question I was really excited to work on. And this connectivity, as I kind of hinted at, is really, really important for wolverines because they live in these high elevation areas, but they're crossing these low elevation, much more populated public, private lands in order to move between these public mountain ranges. And so this connectivity habitat might not seem important when we're looking at resident animals, but it's critical to their dispersal, which is important for, um, to prevent inbreeding. So these animals have to disperse so that they can find a potential mate and establish a new home range to begin breeding. And this kind of scales out to a much bigger question that we can think about. So this is a general wildlands connectivity map for North America. And we can see that the Western US has a lot more potential for connectivity analyses and connectivity conservation than a lot of other portions of the US. And I've mentioned wolverines are on this high elevation public land. And actually, our models show, between my model and Dr. Inman, one of my committee members' models, show that 92 to 96 percent of high-quality wolverine habitat is already on public land. So by connecting wolverine habitat, we could help facilitate a connected network of wildlands across the western U.S. So this could, this could create a connected wildland network for the United States as well. My study area was the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem primarily. So most of the animals that were collared, they were fit with either VHF or GPS collars or both. And they were collared around the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, which is a large area that encompasses both Yellowstone National Park and the Grand Tetons. Given that we all live in this area, you're probably very familiar with it. I don't need to give you a ton of details about it. But for reference, you're here. And all of these little blue dots represent wolverine locations. So these animals were relocated at regular intervals, and we got a fixed point for each animal. So this represents uh, 38 animals collared over nine years. Some of these animals were residents the entire time that they were collared, and some of these animals made large dispersal events or moderate dispersal events that we could identify and use in that validation question that I mentioned earlier. So this is what I was working with when I started. And I mentioned this question, you know, what information is important for a systematic conservation plan to best support Wolverine connectivity under future climate change conditions. And there's really an underlying goal of this whole study that was part of the original funded grant. And that was to be able to make maps that we could hand to a land trust or hand to a land manager and say, this is what you need to do to secure the connectivity of Wolverines in the United States, in the Western United States. Here's, here are the steps and make it as easy as possible for them to find these willing private landowners to work with. And so one of the terms that some of you may be less familiar with, um, so a lot of you I'm sure are familiar with conservation research, but the systematic conservation plan. It's kind of a very specific type of approach to conservation. And this is all based in triage conservation, or triage. And so triage in general is sorting people based on their needs for immediate medical treatment, given their chance for survival. So if you were in a multi-car car accident and you were the only person that was uninjured and you had to help the other people, you have to make decisions about who to help first and who has the best chance of surviving. And we can take this concept of triage, of triage and we can apply it to conservation. So now we're all going to play a little game of let's be the ecologist. Um, so imagine you're studying black-footed ferrets, which is a relative of the wolverine, and you have this large open plain study area. And so you want to go out and you want to protect some black-footed ferrets. And so you go out and, you know, an easy thing to find, large prairie dog towns. And for those of you familiar with black-footed ferrets, you'll know that black-footed ferrets primarily or almost exclusively eat these prairie dogs. And so let's say you go out and you find these, not to scale, giant prairie dogs, two prairie dog colonies, very far apart from each other. And so you're walking around and you realize, okay, perfect. Both of them have black foot and ferrets. But you only have a set amount of conservation dollars. So you have limited options of what you can do here. 
So they're like, well, before we make a decision, let's go out and let's learn a little bit more about these black-footed ferrets. So you go out and you realize that these ferrets are living on this agricultural land with a major highway, and they're actually dividing the population. And we have road mortality, maybe. Um, maybe they're having some negative interactions with the ranchers. And so that's, that's potentially really concerning. And then you go out and say, well, let's worry about disease as well. So for those of you familiar with this species, uh, they carry the plague, the black or the black footed ferrets can catch the plague from the prairie dogs. And these prairie dogs and black footed ferrets, when they're sick, have about 85% mortality. So very, very high mortality that requires vaccinations um, and for fleas to prevent the spread of this disease. And they all have the disease, right? They're sick prairie dogs everywhere. And so you have to make a decision. What am I gonna do with my money? Which population am I gonna focus on? Let's say you only have enough money to do one. Well, if you're like, these guys are in trouble. There's this big road, there's these ranchers, they're really sick, maybe we should start with them. And no matter your best efforts, if you're going out, you're vaccinating them, you're doing whatever you can, maybe they're still dying. That's just not enough. You can't, you can't compensate for all of the problems. And while you've been so focused on these guys, the other population has also tanked, and now you've lost both. Like your efforts in one have completely lost both populations. If you focus on this other population that has less going on, and you spend your money there, this population is still going to tank, but you've done a good job for this other group. And that's kind of the foundation of triage conservation, right? You, you have to make these tough decisions with limited conservation dollars. And this is pretty typical reality for a lot of, of different groups and land trusts. So a great way to do this, to do this conservation triage, is through systematic conservation planning. And systematic conservation planning, I have five of them here, but it includes six steps. And we're going to go through them systematically so as not to overwhelm anyone. So the first is deciding what features should be used to represent a conservation target. So in order to make a decision, you have to actually know what you want to protect. And so we started thinking about this for wool rains and came up with a list of seven important variables, which I'm going to walk through. So the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the overall goal of the study was to protect movement, to protect an activity. So it would be pretty bad to set up this whole thing and not have a connectivity variable. So I have two connectivity variables. <coughs> so this is connectivity value. This is an output from a program called CircuitScape. And areas that are blue are really highly important for connectivity. So loss of these areas in blue could really disproportionately compromise the connectivity of this habitat in black. We can also look at centrality which is uh, from a program called Linkage Mapper. And this tells you, you know, which cores are being connected by areas that are really highly important to link those areas. So the, dark, the darker the blue, the more important that pathway is for movement, given this least cost path, or least cost distance of how the animals might move. Another really important factor is actually having wolverines. Um, so we want to make sure we actually have animals that are reproducing and able to move around. It's not really helpful to protect connectivity if there's not animals to use it. And so we came up with these, other, these two additional variables, one of which is core size. So both male and female wolverines are territorial, and they typically exclude the same sex from their territory. So female wolverines typically don't have overlapping home ranges with other female wolverines or slight overlaps. And so we'll see that the bigger an area of high quality habitat, the more females it can support. And we want more breeding females, so we should be prioritizing, in theory, for larger cores. And as a note, you'll notice that there's some high value cores up here. This originally did include part of Canada, so this is weighted based on habitat both in the US and Canada. We also had really, I luckily, um, some genetic data. So in 2016, 2017 winter, um, there was a crew with this wolverine group that went out and did camera trapping and collected hair snare data from wolverines and we were able to identify whether or not patches had males and females, females only, males only, or unknown if we couldn't get DNA extracted. And so weighting really high those areas that had both male and females or females. And this is important, one, because we need females to produce offspring to move, but two, because females typically don't move as far as males so it's more important to focus on having those reproducing females that might not be dispersing as much when we're prioritizing. The next set of variables we looked at are human variables. So uh, I mentioned in the example with the black-footed ferrets, we had the agricultural land and the, the road mortality contributing. 
And rogue mortality is a really, really big deal for Mustelid. So there's a lot of evidence that weasels are struck by cars quite often. And there's a lot of evidence from recreation studies that wolverines avoid humans. And there's also a lot of um, Native American knowledge from Canada, from Native American knowledge holders, that wolverines do not like being near human settlements. So given all of this information, we came up with three variables that could really help us get at human risk. Road density being one, so the number of roads per square kilometer. Um, this is housing density in 2010. And so are there a ton of houses? Are you in a city or are you out in kind of rural farmland and getting at that uh, issue of density of how many people are on the landscape? And as I mentioned, this is under future conditions. So we are actually projecting this for 2050 to make sure our variables were as usable as possible over the long term. So this is the likelihood of conversion of land from rural to exurban or exurban to urban from 2010 to 2050. So if we think about it, if a farm is a big agricultural farm, a wolverine might move through that. But if it becomes a subdevelopment, they're much less likely to move through that. So we want to make sure we're protecting areas where we might have a really high risk of conversion. So the next step in our conservation plan is to create these systematic or explicit conservation goals, right? I gave you that really vague goal at the beginning of like making a map to help people, but that's not enough for Wolverines. And so I came up with this very wordy um, goal of identifying private parcels. And the goal being that we want to work with willing private landowners where the land doesn't already have some sort of protection, either federal land or in a conservation easement. And we want to find areas that are important for connectivity that connect those large core areas that have females and are at risk of being converted or lost. But that goal presents a very, very serious problem we see in systematic conservation planning. And that is namely that areas that are really important to avoid human conflict with wildlife or avoid these anthropogenic impacts often don't line up with areas that are important for ecological processes. A lot of this research comes out of work on Asian elephants. And the researchers have found that areas where humans and elephants are coming into conflict are not necessarily the areas where these elephants are grazing or having offspring. They're very disparate areas. And so trying to prioritize both of those can be really challenging because you have these conflicting answers to your question. And that makes sense with wolverines, right? Areas where they might be having conflict with ranchers is not the same area where they're probably producing offspring. So we want to make sure we think about that disconnect. And to do that, I decided to divide my models into three separate models. So the first model was the anthropogenic and ecological model. So the model with everything, like throw all the variables in the model and let's see what happens. And so we can see here, this model has areas of high priority where wolverines, places where wolverines typically live, like the Cascades, around the Greater Yellowstone, Glacier, Central Idaho, makes sense. And that's at all those variables. But what happens if we pull out all the human variables was my next question. Let's think about just the ecology of the animal. How do those things differ? So this is what, this is just the addition of all of those variables together and what areas pop is important. But we can see, we see a lot of similar areas, you know, the GYE, North Cascades, and this is just with those four ecological variables. And then I thought, well, we should probably look at the model that most closely addresses the, the original goal of the analyses, which was connectivity. And the reason I chose to do connectivity value without centrality is because Previous research in the Wolverine world by Meredith McClure, who was a PhD student here in 2012, um, and a subsequent paper she published, found that CircuitScape, this program, is the best way to model Wolverine movement. So she compared different ways of modeling animal movement, and she found that CircuitScape is the best. And part of that is because CircuitScape assumes that an animal knows nothing about where it's going. Like it's just like wandering around in the ether that is the landscape. Which for a wolverine leaving its mother's home range for the first time makes a lot of sense. It's much different than you know, a least cost path that assumes the animal knows the optimum perfect pathway through some landscape. So I also created this connectivity only model or C model. And when we look at these side by side, we can see there's different areas that pop out in each model. So we can see like this connectivity model puts much more emphasis around this like um, north-south corridor in western Montana. And if we actually subtract those layers from each other, so this is an example from the anthropogenic and ecological, subtracting the ecological model just to see where they agree and disagree, we can see that there, there are noticeable differences. There are areas where 
having these anthropogenic inputs, the model's not in agreement with the ecological only. So a good example is the Olympic Peninsula. So that area is actually considered okay wolverine habitat, but there's not a lot of ways for them to get there. There's, there's a lot of road blockages and, and development in Washington that would prevent that from being accessible to a wolverine. So the next step then, we have all, we have all of these um, variables set up and we have these models. So it's important to identify how much we're already meeting those goals because it would be a pretty poor conservation planning problem if we got out there and we had already, all of this stuff was already protected. And so um, this top model is just showing this dark, dark black is the Wolverine habitat, high quality habitat. And these are the three different models. Here in the white, we have protected lands. So that's federally owned land and conservation easements. So it has some level of protection. There might be logging, there might be reclamation, but it's better than no land that could become a housing development. And we can see a lot of it's covered, right? I mentioned 92 to 96% of high quality wolverine habitat is on federal land. But especially over here in the connectivity model, there's a lot of areas for improvement, right? There's a lot of blue still showing that high priority area. And so I've kind of merged four and five, and you'll see why in a second. But we have to have methods then for identifying what areas, right? I just showed you, okay, there's all this blue. It's probably important. Well, how do we go about locating and designing protected areas? And then how do we actually tell people which area is most important? How do we implement that? And there was a paper that came out uh, by Bayer et al. in 2016 that noted that in these sort of problem sets where we're trying to make protected areas, one of the best things we can do if we have access to it is it, it's an optimization problem, especially if we have uh, data on property value, right? We can just do an economic optimization and figure out what areas require protection based on this idea of you know, optimizing our ability to protect land. And luckily for us, Montana actually has some of the best cadastral data or property value data in the United States. And so I've, I've truncated this here because we don't really get many wolverines that are moving past this zone. So we don't have any of that data on genetics or anything past like the, the, the little belts and big belts. And so, we can see here there's property data from the highest value properties in red to the lowest value properties in green. And there's differences across these literally hundreds of thousands of parcels. And so a really, really cool idea that I came across is this package called Prioritizer in R. And this package uses integer linear programming techniques in order to give you an interface to build and solve conservation planning problems. And so we're gonna step back for a second and walk through a really simple problem so that this is much easier on the far side. And thanks to my reviewers, I took out all the equations, so hopefully you'll all be very glad that except for maybe some of the statisticians in the room. Um, so we have, this is now our study area. So we've got some areas we don't have information, but let's pretend this little square is our study area. And we have cost value for that study area. And so there's cheap properties in the southern end. And as we move north, those properties on average become more and more expensive. So we have all this data on cost. And then for the cheapest amount of money. And we might get a solution that looks like this. So for that grid, the 10% best of those features for the cheapest. And then we can run it again and say, okay, give us the 15. And that would be the, both the yellow and the green together. We can say, give us a 20% best. And this is really useful because we can then provide land trust with something like a hierarchy, right? Like the green is the most important places you should be thinking about then focus on the yellow, then focus on the red. So it gives us this hierarchy or this stepwise way of doing conservation. So here's another potential solution. A really, really cool thing about this program is it assigns each little parcel a value, and we can use those values to do some really cool things. So if you give this to a land trust, you're saying, okay, all the green stuff is important, which is really helpful, but is this green, is this green parcel more important than that green parcel? How do you know what parcel is really the most important or which one you should be working on getting first. And so you can actually calculate the irreplaceability of a parcel. So you can look at that parcel and you can do um, a cost replacement method, so pulling that out and trying to replace it. And you can see, are there other cost optimal solutions? And so here, these red parcels are like, if you don't get those four parcels, you cannot meet your goal. Those are critical to meeting that minimum cost objective. 
And so we can use this parcel score to generate this irreplaceability score. Basically, they're typically scored from 0 to 1. And the closer they get to infinity in this, in this output, the more important they are to the solution. So it's a really simple way to be able to map this back out and say, focus here. And so now that we've walked through this simpler version, here are my conservation target features. Here's my property data. And I threw all this in and set up all my code and said, let's run with it. And each of my models gave me a different number of parcels. So I did this for those target goals for the 10% best, 15% best, and 20% best while minimizing those costs. And so for the connectivity, the 10% best parcels represented 286 individual pieces of land. Now I'm going to show you a really overwhelming map that I don't expect you to get a lot out of, but it is important. So this is like a thing we could give a digital copy of a land trust to, and they could zoom in up to areas. And so I don't know how well you can see in the back, but there's like parcels that are red. There are parcels that are green, parcels that are this orangey yellow. And then I can also calculate the irreplaceability for every single parcel. Now a more manageable version of looking at this is say something like, like this. So this is showing us what counties had the highest number of parcels per area. So if you take how many of those parcels exist in a solution, and you divide that by the land area of the county, and I, I did account for these ones that I cut off funky, um, which ones have the highest number of solutions? And we can see there's slight differences, but counties like Mineral County really pop in all of these. Um, zooming in, it's a little more helpful. So now we're zooming into our own county in Park County, so highlighted here. And again, location, so we all know where we are. And we can see, OK, there's a green parcel. That's 10% solution. That's a 20% solution. So we can look at these specific parcels of priority area and figure out what places are really, really important. And then we can run that irreplaceability. And we can see, wow, there's so many parcels. A lot of them really are like not, not that highly irreplaceable. If we get one versus the other, not a big deal. But if we see ones like these ones that are greenish, and there's a, there's a little tiny dark blue one that's kind of hard to see. But we know those parcels are really, really irreplaceable. Those parcels are really critical to our solution. So we can say, you know, maybe those are the landowners we want to go talk to first and see if, they, see if they're willing to like, communicate with a land trust. Those are the people we should really be thinking about first. And we can also look at this as averages. So if we take this um, irreplaceability at the parcel level, we can average that and look at, okay, how many irreplaceable parcels are there in each county by area? And we can see, okay, there's some counties where those are the first counties we should be looking at. Those are the counties where we have the most number of parcels, but if we don't get those, we're going to see a loss of connectivity conservation for Wolverines. And so, those, I mean, it's really noticeable which ones pop first, and it makes sense if we're trying to connect Wolverines up near Glacier to Wolverines down near Yellowstone or to central Idaho. So this work represents the most comprehensive connectivity analysis on Wolverines. I'm not saying just this paper that I presented today, but the entire dissertation. And I presented this goal at the beginning, which was to create these maps for land trusts to secure the connectivity of Wolverines in the US uh, while working with these will willing private landowners. And focused on this research question of the systematic conservation plan, what is the best possible way to go about doing this type of analysis. Uh, I think that using this software, using this op uh, optimization software, provides really, really valuable insights into the best approach for wolverine conservation. And I think it's widely applicable to a number of species if we have the information we need. So having this, this clear methodology uh, that's really defensible on how to go about doing conservation and prioritization is really helpful. Um, Given the threats in general for species associated with climate change and human-caused land use change and habitat loss and fragmentation, connect connectivity conservation is the single most important thing that we can do to protect wolverines. So securing this network of open spaces for wolverines and their dispersal is more important than the short-term persistence of them in any of these little isolated populations. So it's, I think, more important than, say, moving wolverines around to allow them to move by themselves because it will facilitate natural species reestablishment and recovery and it will prevent some serious problems like inbreeding. So it facilitates these natural behaviors that we would see. Bringing it back around, I had mentioned that there's this disconnect, right? That I looked at three models because 
there is potential that these human impacts might not align with the ecological processes. And we do see that. We do see that there are, there are differences in the models, both in areas where the highest number of parcels that are important are, but also just visually looking at the data. And so there was this conundrum of deciding, well, which of these models is really actually the one we should be sharing? And I believe that the, that the best model, the best prioritization model here, is the anthropogenic and the ecological model. Because we're not going to conserve wolverines without thinking about human impacts on the species. And this result, these results provided a novel and valuable tool set for wolverine conservation, but it is critical to remember that they're just a tool set. Managers and policymakers still need to think about what kinds of things we were prioritizing when we created these conservation resources. Um, so wolverines, like many other species, you know, face threats associated with human-caused habitat loss and fragmentation that are serious bar barriers to their dispersal. And while these threats are important to consider when thinking about this anthropogenic and ecological model that I talked about, uh, determining how to properly incorporate data on threats for species requires really deep understanding of their ecology and information about where important ecological processes are happening versus where important human um, related threats have occurred. So it's, it's really, every time these types of analyses are done, it's really important to think about that potential disconnect. Bringing it back to kind of this broad picture, as I mentioned, um, connectivity in general is critical not only to ensuring um, that these populations stay connected, but for planning for anthropogenic impacts under future conditions. And protecting these high quality wolverine areas that are located on these high elevation public lands is really a great way to make sure that we are creating a connected wildlands network that will facilitate the movement of a number of species and create a more resilient system of protected areas in the western US because there's a lot there's a lot of potential here. With that, I would like to thank my committee for being here. Um, all of the people who provided me with statistical advice, my family, um, all of my current and former lab mates, ecology friends, faculty members, MSU grad students, my students, a lot of my mammalogy students are here, um, the Wolverine Working Group, and really just, just everyone for making this a great three and a half years of my life. Um, I couldn't have thought of a better possible you know, way to be wrapping it up. So thank you all for being here. I also have, and it's not working so I can minimize it, but a, oh, what's it doing? A really cool Wolverine video to share that my students have already seen before I get questions. <laughs> it gets better. He really gets he really gets spinning. <laughs> I did also make a gif of this if anyone wants it. <laughs> <laughs> Unrelenting. <laughs> so thank you all.